My name is Susan Kurtzman. I am the president of the board of the Truro Historical Society and I'm the former curator here. So I've kind of had a long history with this place. And we're really proud tonight to have a wonderful um, talk by Carlotta Ziliax and Tim Richards. And I'm going to give you a little bit of intro about them. So Carlotta Dyer Ziliax has summered in Truro her entire life. In fact, she is the fifth generation of Dyers to live in her family home on North Pamuk Road, built in 1832 by her great-great-grandfather, who was also the owner of the mill at Mill Pond. Am I correct? Listen, investment. Yeah, in the Mill Pond. Inspired by her family history, as well as her years of volunteering right here at the Highland House Museum, and her many years as a teacher, Carlotta was delighted to find that her summer neighbor, Tim Richards, was a keen researcher both of the Mill Pond and of Truro's maritime history. As long as I've known Carlotta, and it's been probably 25 years, she has been a huge contributor to the stories and the local history that we have and that we value here at the Highland House and the Truro Historical Society. She's one of our local historians. Oh, and by the way, um, once upon a time, kind of a long time ago, Carlotta was Tim's babysitter. <laughs> he told me history stories. <laughs> She's the one who got him interested in all of them. So Tim Richards has come to Churro every summer since 1958. His family has owned a house on North Pamuk Road since 1961. In 2017, Tim and his wife, Meg Clark, purchased a home on the Mill Pond and thus began Tim's interest and extensive research into Truro's history, starting with the Truro Tide Mill and continuing with the magnificent exhibition that you see behind you today, focusing on the Pamuk Harbor's history from the mid-19th century. After his 23-year career with GE, Tim now teaches at the University of Pennsylvania and consults on business strategies for engagement with international governments. His career includes publications, including an article on the Tide Mill, which appeared in the journal International Molinology in December 2022. This exhibition would not be possible without the contributions of many people and many organizations, and we want to thank them all. Thank you, Chuck Steinman, for being here to help us with this. The Truro Historical Society greatly appreciates the financial support which the Truro Cultural Council and the Truro Community Preservation Committee provided to this exhibit. The Wellfleet Library also made its 3D printer available for printing those model schooners that you see in there. They're 3D printed. And we also want to thank Neil Personius, who was the artist and model maker who created the model. So I invite you now to listen to Carlotta and to Tim as they go through a wonderful um, explanation of this entire exhibition, which really took more than a year to put together and become a member, and you'll see more. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, everyone. It is a real pleasure to be here with Carlotta. And thank you very much to uh, both the Truro Historical Society and the Friends of the Truro Meeting House, who are our co-sponsors this evening. I wanted to just mention a few other people who were part of this exhibit. Susan mentioned that um, Neil Personius built the model. Also, those schooners were designed by a uh, Coast Guard Academy faculty member, who many of us in the room know by the name of Nick Custer. They are actually real models of what those scooters probably looked like. Um, and they were printed by a guy named Chris Sikaj, who's a Truro resident, and they took about six hours per schooner on the Wellfleet Library 3D printer. So that's pretty extraordinary. Um, thank you also to uh, Jim Summers, who's here uh, helping with the seating right now. Jan Worthington, who conceived of the whole idea of an exhibit about the Hammett River. Um, and I want to mention also Andrew Young. So we're going to hear a lot about the Dyers. Andrew Young is a rich. He's been a member of the Rich family. 
He shared a tremendous amount of information about the Rich family history and his own experience that helped us to put uh, both this presentation and a lot of the exhibit together. So, Carlotta and I are going to talk about Hammett Harbor in the mid-19th century. And I'm going to just look at my notes here for a second to get it all right, because at that time, Truro was the home to literally the best mackerel fishermen in the country, probably in the world. Truro nurtured the captains of the finest ships afloat in the world. Truro produced the most attractive and effective sails for those schooners in New England. There were four wharves, dozens of businesses, including two shipyards building 70 to 80 foot schooners and brigs on Hammock River, right near the present harbor. In 1836, over 60 schooners and 500 fishermen were fishing out of Truro, out of that little place that is Hammock Harbor. It's the same place, but with some differences. Yet by 1870, pretty much all the businesses in the harbor were gone. The entire place had been abandoned. We're going to talk about, um, first of all, how did it happen? What happened? And how did Thoreau become this place that was a real maritime center of excellence? And then a little bit, what, what happened? And why did it fade away so rapidly? Carl? Well, first of all, <clears throat> through the eyes of the Dyers, Dyers were by far one of many families that participated in this boom of fishing and deep sea fishing, a deep uh, water uh, mercantile trade and so on. Um, riches, as you pointed out, snowies and so on and so forth. It just happens that they never throw anything away. And uh, I have... Can you uh, raise your voice a little bit further? Oh, sorry. I'll use the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <clears throat> um, I live in the house, as uh, Susan said, uh, that my great-great-grandfather built, and I was able to um, find a lot of documents, papers, notebooks, and so on, which have contributed to the specifics and also the individuals who were able to uh, be able, <laughs> who were able to go on and be part of this uh, real commercial success of Truro. And I think that having uh, that specific kind of look at what goes on gives us a chance to correct some of the myths and also some of the... Um, Keep going. I'm afraid of this. Yeah, I am. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and it, it, it's been very exciting to me because I wasn't sure what it all meant. And Tim is somebody who can really decode it, put it in context with other uh, archival material. We're going to attempt to use the microphone. Does that help at all? Back yeah. there? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Our first applause line. We're going to use the microphone. So, <clears throat> let's begin with a story. <clears throat> Many of you know about the terrible storm of the first few days of October of 1841. 57 Truro men and boys were killed. Uh, seven Truro schooners didn't come back. Um, there was an eighth Truro schooner that we're going to tell a story about, and that was the Garnet, captained by Joshua Knowles, crewed by all by boys and men from Truro. The Garnet survived the storm, but the boat was rolled over. Uh, it was awash. The mainmast was gone. The foremast was a stump, and uh, they put a jury rig sail on the foremast and tried to move, but it was almost impossible to sail the boat. Uh, the crew survived on potatoes that were floating up from the hold. On the second day, a schooner went by on the horizon. They tried to flag it down, but uh, they were not seen. And on October 5th, over the horizon came the topsails of a large ship. And Captain Knowles and his crew pulled out their flag and waved furiously, and they attempted to sail their crippled craft in the direction of this ship. And fortunately, somebody on the ship noticed their flag and diverted, and the ship, which was this ship, the Roskius, pulled up alongside within hailing distance. And who should step to the rail to hail Captain Knowles but 
Captain John Collins. Captain John Collins was from Fur. Captain John Collins had been Captain John Knowles next door neighbor. <laughs> Not only that, but one of the mates on board the Roskius was a man named Caleb Payne, who was from All these people lived within about two miles of each other. Actually, all 57 men and boys who died, and I assume it was only like Barnett, all lived within a two mile circle. Anyway, one more thing about the Roskius. It was owned by a guy named Edward Collins. It was part of the dramatic line, owned by Edward Collins. Edward Collins lived in Truro until he was 15 years old. So he was, his formative years were in Truro. So you might ask, what was the probability that a stricken schooner, manned entirely by folks from Truro, and drifting hundreds of miles south of Georgia's bank, would be rescued by a New York packet coming from Liverpool, captained by a man from Truro, with a mate from Truro, and owned by someone from Truro. Mm -hmm. And you would think the odds were very long, but I hope after we finish talking, you might realize that maybe it wasn't quite so extraordinary after all. Dyers arrived in Truro about 1705 when Dr. William came with his wife Mary and eight children. And um, we need to skip ahead to his great great grandchildren because they are the ones that are involved in this boom period of uh, uh, commercial success in Truro. Uh, Ebenezer Dyer, great great grandson of Dr. William, married Betsy Dyer, another Dyer. Dyer marries Dyer, another great great granddaughter, and uh, they had eight children, six sons, five of whom were mariners during that very special period of, of uh, success in Truro's history. The eldest son, Nathaniel, was my great great grandfather, built my house, and he was the one the family turned to when uh, two of the brothers died quite young, leaving wives and children. And as the administrator of their estates, he kept good records. Would you like to go with that? Yep. Yeah. In these notebooks. Wow. When I was a kid, I used to poke around in the attic upstairs under the eaves, and I would find things very interesting up there. Old shells that were exotic, dry whale baleen, that sort of thing. Um, and what I thought was magnificent was a box of bubbles. Well, actually, they were large glass fish floats that had been piled up to um, uh, be stored in the attic so no one would break them, I guess. But they had been used to keep the, the uh, nets afloat when um, the various ancestors were fishing. Uh, much later, I came to find these notebooks the most interesting thing about that. And that's largely because Tim was able to figure out some really interesting things, like the name of Nathaniel's boat, the concert, which I did not know. Uh, but there are some real specifics, such as who owned shares in some of these boats? How many were on their crews? What were they paying? How much did it cost to uh, outfit a boat for a fresh, uh, fishing <clears throat> voyage or a long haul? Voyage. That kind of specific really fleshes out the whole story that we have here. So this is an artist rendition by my brother Andrew Richards, who's here, of what the harbor looked like around 1848. Um, those of you who have had a chance to look at the model will also have seen that what's in, in, what's in this artist rendition is also what's in the model. Let me just point out a few things. First of all, in 1830, the first major step was taken toward making Truro a really significant harbor. There certainly boats had sailed in and out of Truro before then, but in 1830, 50 locals, local people, investors, built Union Wharf. This is Union Wharf 21, uh, and it was built by those 50 investors uh, in 1830. Soon thereafter, 
we had a second wharf. This is called the Lower Wharf or the South Wharf that was uh, also investor owned. And there was also at that same time a North Wharf which is across the river and actually isn't in the model. It's a little outside of the area of the model, but another wharf to the north. We can see a number of things here. If you look carefully over here, this is a schooner under construction. In 1848, there were two schooners under, in 1848, there were two schooners under construction. Over here, we have a blacksmith shop that was providing some of the uh, hardware that was required for the fishing vessels. And uh, this was a sail loft. Here we have a mackerel packing establishment. And here we have chandlery or uh, general store. And these are two different shipyards back here in the back. Um, it's also worth noting that there is the Truro Meeting House looking down. And the Truro Meeting House was one of the uh, landmarks that Chevna Rich talks about uh, in his book, which is what leads to the title of the book. So, Truro, as I said, had incredible, an incredible leadership position in the maritime sectors. This was true both in quality and in quantity. And we're going to start here with quality uh, as it applies to the mackerel fishing industry. Truro in the 1850 period was home to the very best mackerel fishermen in the country, according to Shevner Rich, who may be prone to exaggeration, but he said it. So um, the number one uh, mackerel fisherman was a guy named Richard Rich, Captain Richard Rich. He was known as Osceola Dick because he sailed on the schooner Osceola. In 1850, we have federal census information. He caught, he and his crew caught $8,000 worth of mackerel. And you can see here, uh, if you can read the scale, these are average mackerel catches per vessel in various locations. Boston was about 1,700 average. Toro was number two at 1,200. So Osceola Dick was catching five times, six times as much as the average fisherman in the very best port of Boston, probably 10 times more than the average in the state. And he wasn't the only one in, um, in Truro, there was also ca Captain Daniel Harding who caught over $7,400 worth of mackerel. So these Truro uh, fishermen were actually the best. Um, and Truro as a whole was pretty far up there. This is Nathaniel, Nathaniel Dyer, and he was uh, the one who kept these notebooks, uh, eldest son and builder of my house great great grandfather. Um, he was not only a fisherman, he exported fish, uh, and he um, was name owner of one of the, the stores that you spoke of. Uh, <clears throat> he was an investor, and this was true of a number of people, in a number of different quotes, a number of different concerns. You don't put all your eggs in one basket, right? So if you have um, a diversified <coughs> portfolio, then you were safe on, on that score. But he was involved, he had his fingers in a lot of topics. Uh, so Truro was not only home to the best mackerel fishermen, it was also the fifth largest mackerel fishing port in the state of Massachusetts in 1836. And it pretty much retained um, a leadership position in terms of quantity all the way through 1855. It was still the sixth largest mackerel port, mackerel and cod port in 1855. Um, and there were 500 fishermen fishing out of Truro in 1836. It had dropped a little bit into the mid 400s by 1855, but it was still a very large, very substantial port. This is one of this is one of the this is from one of the journals, one of the account books that Carlotta found as a girl, and this is the account book of the schooner Pomona. The Pomona was one of those seven vessels that was lost uh, with all hands 
during the gale of 1841. Um, and so we have here the account book in the hand of Solomon Dyer. Solomon was one of those Dyers that you saw in that generation where so many of them went into, into seafaring careers. What I love about, the, the reason I'm starting with this is that what was fun about reading the account book is that first, yes, you get a lot of detail, and we'll talk a little bit about that detail. You also get a glimpse into who this person was, the, the man, Solomon Dyer, who was keeping this account book. And I love this. This says, end of 1839. This, is, this takes up um, the bottom half of a whole page of the account book at the end of the 1839 account. And at that time, Solomon Dyer had been a a fishing captain now for one year, he had succeeded in getting the boat, becoming a captain, getting out there, fishing, catching fish, and they were pretty successful. Um, and you can just feel in this florid script and the size of what he's written and the fact that it's in blue ink and everything else is in black ink, he was so proud. And he was shouting from the rooftops, you know, I did, I made it through this first year. So you get a real feel for the person. We also get some other interesting information. Um, this is not, what I'm about to say is not on the slide, so um, you can't read that, but I will get to that part. But we learned that the Pomona was purchased in Essex, Mass. Uh, in 1839 from the Story shipyard where a lot of Truro vessels were purchased. Uh, we know how much Solomon Dyer and his crew earned. The crew earned about $200 per year for the, those who were not considered boys, so probably those over 16 or 17. They were getting about $200 a year. And uh, Solomon and his cousin, uh, Mr. Hopkins, were receiving over $300. And remember, this was in four months of work, so they did have time in the rest of the year to earn additional body money. And that compares with maybe $180 in Truro for an agricultural worker at the time. We also know uh, that they paid about 12% of their gross earnings to the fish packing and inspection and sales companies. So about 12%, which is pretty good for those, those companies. They were making a better living. The owners of the Pomona, there were five, Solomon, Nathaniel, um, Jeremiah Hopkins, who sailed with Solomon, a man named Manuel House, who uh, was a brother-in-law of the Dyers, and had actually, his real name wasn't House, he was actually from Spain, but um, Manuel House, and then a man named James Livermore. We also know that the Pomona was purchased in part with a note from the sellers, so when the Pomona was lost, there was still a $170 note that had to be paid in Essex, and so the very, very last entries in the account book are about raising the money and then making that payment. Um, these here are the very final, the other very final entries into the account book. And they're now in the hand, the written hand of Nathaniel Dyer. And uh, these are payments to the people who were aboard the Pomona when it was lost. And um, many of the young men, like John Doyle, uh, who was a relative also of Carlisle's. And down here on the lower left, we have, it says, paid S.H. Dyer estate, paid to S.J. Dyer, that is Sarah Jane Dyer, $264.42. Uh, and that's the end of the book. And Carlotta is going to tell us more about Sarah Jane Dyer in just a minute. <coughs> Story. <laughs> um, part of uh, the importance of Toro's uh, navigational history is that it sent people out into the world. They were able to uh, be uh, captains of ships that were into international trading. Uh, <clears throat> up upper left here is John Payne, Captain from Truro, who in 1836 was trading in Denmark. And uh, I'm not sure what it was that he was trading, uh, but he brought home with him 
a 12-year-old boy, Jacob Bohm, <coughs> excuse me, who became Jacob Holmes. And Jacob Holmes is a man, is there on the right. He received his education in Truro, and possibly, we hope, we think, at the Truro Academy. Uh, learned his navigational skills, became captain of a uh, fishing schooner, but then moved on to become a cooper ship captain sailing out of Boston and New York. Um, he's of interest to me because he married two of my great great grandmother's sisters. Sequentially. Excuse me, my great grandmother's sisters. <laughs> Excuse me. Yes, sequentially. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, they overdied me, married me. Sorry. <clears throat> Anyway, um, he is close to my, to my family, and we've always referred to him as Uncle Jacob. Uh, the gentleman in the lower left is uh, my great-grandfather, Nathaniel Atkins, died, are always called by the first two names to uh, distinguish him from his father, Nathaniel Dyer. And he was not a mariner, but he was absolutely fascinated by all of his classmates at the Truro Academy who became captains the world over, who became fishermen, who became coastal captains, traders, excuse me, captains of coasters as they call them in the coastal trading business. And he kept quite an inventory of this in 18, this would you say, 18, roughly? 50, 1850-ish, this document. This document. And it's quite uh, important for us to see exactly uh, who had which boat and how they managed it to go ahead um, with that situation. And just a couple more things on this. Did you mention that Jacob Holmes first sailed on Daniel Dyer's schooner? No, I didn't. So, yeah, so he, when Jacob Holmes comes to the United States, he sails as a boy on Nathaniel Dyer's vessel. So that uh, got him into the Dyer family very quickly. Um, and then one other thing to point out here, in the exhibit, some of you may have seen that Levi Stevens is identified as the captain of the Southern Cross, one of the Clipper ships. He's the first one mentioned by Nathaniel Atkins here in this list. Uh, that was a really prestigious command, the Southern Cross, and that's undoubtedly why he put him first there. We wanted to just put we wanted to just put this up because we wanted to put the model area a little bit in context. So the model shows this red square, and that's where we have the two shipyards. We have Union Wharf, Lower Wharf, Hinkley Wharf, the Devereux Sail Loft. Uh, this is a mackerel packing uh, organization and a general store. All of these are in this map from, 18, uh, from 1848, and so that's one of the reasons we used that year for the exhibition. Uh, and also other things here, there was a Hammond Harbor lighthouse at that time. There were salt works galore. The, these are all salt works. These are salt works. And those salt works, and those are salt works probably, those are supplying salt to pack the mackerel so they could be maintained and shipped. And on this north wharf, you've got a sail loft, fish packing, and a general store, all of which is not in the model, in addition to the things that we've talked about that are in the model. So, back to some both background and quality points. This is a picture of the interior of a ship of a sail making loft in Castine, Maine, in the late 19th century, but it's probably pretty similar to what the interior of the sail lofts would have looked like in Truro in 1848 in that period. Um, and this is the story shipyard in Essex where the Pomona came from. Other of the Truro uh, fishing schooners came from there. And this is probably a lot like what it would have looked like to be building a schooner in Truro. And this is what it looked like to pack the mackerel into barrels, because that's what was done. It was the mackerel was packed, sorted by size, inspected by inspectors, and uh, with salt added, was packed into the barrels. I mentioned earlier the idea that Truro made excellent sails. This is something that Shevner Rich specifically talks about. He says that the Truro fleet always had the best sails, the best looking, the best fitting 
sales of any town in all of New England. Um, and particularly those came from the Devereux uh, sale, sale loft, which was the one that was on Union Wharf. And you had to get the fish out and distribute it. Uh, and um, Nathaniel Dyer would send some of his catch to New York, to D.D. Starin, a uh, fish monger there. Um, and that he did by using this stencil for probably the top of the mackerel barrel. Uh, <clears throat> on the right, lower right, is a picture of uh, Joshua Davis. And he was the preceptor and founder of the Truro Academy, which occupied, uh, excuse me, um, was uh, active, sorry, from 1840 to 1854. Uh, he was much trusted by a number of investors. They built in a uh, purpose-built academy building. You can see it today in Wellfleet. It was moved there from probably an area somewhere near Hatch Road. That's where we think it, it existed when it was in operation in Thurrow. And it was later sold and moved <clears throat> to Wellfleet just down from where um, uh, Midgate Hardware is. That's, that's the uh, old academy building. <clears throat> it was quite a, a liberal and progressive educational institution, uh, <clears throat> very much uh, touted by various people. A lot of navigational uh, information was imparted there, and many of the mariners got their education in, in navigation there. It also welcomed girls, as well as boys, and had uh, quite a broad curriculum, as, as well as uh, navigation. Okay. Um, it just re-emphasized the ownership point. Oh, yeah. That a number of people invested in the academy, and um, actually pre-invested in it, and, and told him, he had to come back from Andor in order to uh, found this school. They were so certain that this was the vision of the future in her. So <clears throat> I asked the question at the beginning, how did all this happen? How did Furrow become such a center? And uh, there's, no there's no simple answer to that. What I do think is that, first of all, you sort of think of the Outer Cape as a whole, as a place where, number one, there are good harbors. So Wellfleet, Truro, Provincetown, all had good harbors at this time. Number two, there's very little to do on land to make money. Um, and number three, it's close to George's Bank. So George's Bank was the primary American fishing ground at that time. So you have three good reasons why, why you would become a maritime center. And then it kind of feeds on itself. This is, you know, I think how things really work. You have these industrial clusters, and it's, it, this was a maritime industrial cluster where people were educated. You had actual education. You had cross shareholdings. So if you're running a mackerel packing establishment, you really want all of those fishing schooners to be successful. So you're going to share information. If you own your neighbor's schooner, and your other neighbor's schooner and your own schooner, you're going to want to share information so that all of those schooners can catch as much as possible. And in the process, then you end up with sea captains who are the best in the world, and they come back and they share their knowledge, and then young people want to go into the industry. So this is, this is theoretical, but I think that you could argue that that's probably what happened here. Now, all of this prosperity and incredible capability came at a price. And the price was that fishing is a very risky occupation, we know that. But in the 19th century, it was a, even more of a risky occupation. You can see here, this is the storm of 1841, plus a few other deaths that year. And that was a terrible event. But even if you take that out, every year you can see there are deaths of mariners in Toronto. Sometimes 15, 20, more than 20. So, yes, the storm of 1841 was a horrible event and calamitous. 
but it wasn't the only one at all. And if you take the median and you take out, well, it doesn't really matter whether you take it out or not. The median is five deaths per year. And think about that. These are in a town between 1,200 people and two th rising to 2,000 people. You have an average of five every year, men between the ages of 14 and 50 dying. Pretty extraordinary. Um, so the level of risk was tremendous. And we can look at that another way, which is that if you fished out of Truro or sailed out of Truro between the ages, if you started when you're 14 um, and you sailed for 16 years, you had the same probability, roughly, that you would die as if you were a soldier in the American Civil War. And uh, Henry David Thoreau in Cape Cod has this wonderful quote. That it, it starts with, who lives in that house, I inquired. Three widows was the reply. And then he says, the stranger, that is the visitor, and the inhabitant view the shore with very different eyes. The former may have come to see and admire the ocean in a storm, but the latter looks on it as the scene where his nearest relatives were wrecked. And that happened a lot. Leaving widows and children. And this widow, um, Elizabeth Peterson, is not a daughter, uh, but it's a wonderful portrait, I think, um, from the Cobb archive of a woman left by her husband who died at sea in uh, 1819, mm -hmm. Captain Thomas Peterson. Um, and I noticed she's wearing a hairpin. I don't know whether that might contain the hair of her husband, but that was very frequently something that um, people did to memorialize a, a loved one. Uh, <clears throat> when Tim first asked me, well, what about the dire women? Well, okay, they certainly weren't fishing boat captains, I can tell you that. But I immediately began to think about the widows, and there were three that I looked at. And my first question was, how did they cope? How did they add to all the things that women had to do in the 19th century, in their homes and in the gardens and then with the livestock and the children? Uh, and then cope without the husband, without the father of their children. Um, and I found three examples. Sarah Jane Dyer, uh, widow of Solomon Dyer. She was in her early 20s and pregnant when he died in 1841. And uh, Tim discovered that she was uh, listed in the 1850 census as living with her father. So he had been widowed five years earlier, and it's tempting to think that while he provided her and his grandson, Solomon Jr., um, with a home, she was able to keep house for him. So that was one way that a, a widow might go back to her own family. Second widow that I looked at was Betsy Dyer Lee. Uh, she was the sister of Solomon Dyer, so she lost her brother in the 1841 gale, and, and her adoptive son, John Doyle, who was crewing for his uncle. And to that loss, two years later, she lost her husband. This was one strong lady. She was 51 years a widow, and in her obituary in the Provincetown Advocate, uh, it was noted that many people in Truro called her Aunt Betsy because she was ever helpful. And she had at her back and turned to, for her support, the church. She was an early member of the church, and she walked the walk, not only taking care of her own children, but showing up when people were sick in the home, when children were being born, when people were dying. And she was said to be uh, invariably cheerful and common sense. I never saw that expression before, but I like it. She was common sense. Uh, she, too, was pregnant when her husband died. And I infer that she would probably got some support from her brother Atkins and his wife Paulina because the baby who was born, she named Paulina Atkins Lee. Third widow I looked at was Paulina herself. In 1854, her husband succumbed to uh, typhoid fever. 
which was um, disease was also a mariner's problem, particularly uh, if he visited foreign ports. And Atkins traded in Cuba and Curacao. And it's very likely that that's where he contracted the disease. Um, she remarried quite quickly. She had a six-year-old daughter, and that gave her a home and her daughter a home right away. Sadly, uh, in 1858, she died in childbirth. And so her child, now 10, Lorena Dyer, came to live with Nathaniel Dyer, the eldest uncle, who had been appointed guardian. Um, this is one of the ways families were able to support one another. By the way, Marina Dyer later married a Solomon Ryder and became Truro's first librarian. Um, that's three ways in which widows were able to cope. Um, going back to the family, turning to the church, and the marriage. And we also heard from the Thoreau quote that they sometimes banded together and lived as one. Now, Truro knew about widows because, as Richard Whalen observed, 27 new widows were made by the 1841 Gale, but that made a total of 105 in this small town. So widows were something people, the community, came forward and supported. A better and happier story for the next generation. <laughs> this is my great-grandmother on the left, Priscilla Knowles Dyer. And this is her sister, Emily Holmes. Now, Emily Holmes, as the second wife of Uncle Jacob, um, was privileged as captain's wife to travel around the world in his clipper ship with him. He, this was a voyage that um, is documented in her letters here of uh, 1887 to 89, sort of the end of the clipper ship era. Um, this is the ship Republic, not to be confused with the Great Republic, which is one of the most famous of the Clipper ship. But it was the end of that era, and Uncle Jake was still trusted by owners to uh, turn out good business by, by trade. Uh, Aunt Emily was a record keeper, too. <laughs> she kept a journal letter, and day by day, she recorded her experiences at the sea, and then when she would visit port, she had her reflections on well, what she saw there. She would, when they came into port, send an installment of her journal letter to her dear, my dear sister, Wilma, my great-grandmother. And so these two women, born and raised in Truro, on what is now Truro Center Road, and their horizons expanded considerably uh, Emily by going around the world, and her sister by learning about it through these letters. And this was passed down through my aunt, uh, who wrote up stories my aunt Emily told me, to me. So my mind, too, was, um, <laughs> shall we say, expanded by working through these letters and her reflections on the things that happened. Um, at sea, she would talk about gales that happened, Raising geraniums in the captain's cabin, the death of their cat, um, and most poignant, uh, the Christmas box that they would open, which had been packed by her sister way months earlier for them to open on Christmas Day when they were at sea. Um, yes. Uh, their voyage around the world uh, was documented by my great great grandfather because she sent him abstracts of the log uh, showing their daily position, longitude and latitude. And so I did some of that this winter, um, showing how uh, they managed to get around the world. And they did pretty well until they reached the Straits in Indonesia. The Makassar Straits are uh, notorious, I guess, for uh, sailing ships because they're shoals adverse currents and adverse winds do not help them. And, and they were more or less trapped in there for 47 days. And the heat reached 115 <coughs> degrees because it's on the equator. Uh, and when they finally made it out into the Pacific, Uncle Jacob was supposed to have said, it feels like I just got out of jail. <laughs> <laughs> they then crossed the Pacific, uh, reaching Tacoma, Washington Territory. Uh, where they unloaded mostly tea that they had gotten in Yokohama. But uh, while they were in Yokohama, 
uh, they did the touristy thing and got photographed in kimonos. <laughs> so uh, that was amusing. Uh, they arrived back home after leaving the ship in Valparaiso. Uh, they came back by steamer and crossed the Isthmus of Panama on land, uh, this being 1889. Mm -hmm. um, and Aunt Emily reflected uh, that the French were making a hatch out of trying to build this canal, and nothing would happen until Uncle Sam took over. <laughs> Which turned out to be true <laughs> in, in 1914, as we know, long after Uncle Jacob's death, uh, the canal was finished. Uh, and two years, after, and some days, after they left, they reached home. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, <clears throat> Pearl was not doing so well during this period while Emily was going around the world. Um, from about the 1830s, the fishermen of Truro, the sailors of Truro, knew that the harbor was beginning to show a lot. The channel was being impinged by sandbars that were moving down along the shore of the bay. And it was okay for quite a few years, but there were several attempts made to shore it up and maintain the channel. Um, unfortunately, all of these were unsuccessful. So there were efforts in 1839, 1848, uh, and 1850. When the 1854 effort failed uh, and the harbor continued to shoal, uh, pretty much that was the end. And it was exacerbated. The situation was exacerbated by the fact that the latest fishing technology moving into using nets rather than just hooking was requiring larger vessels. So Toro was getting shallower and the vessels were requiring more water. It was not a good formula. And so what happened is Toro went from 1855, this is 440 fishermen and 49 vessels. By 1865, in 10 years, all those vessels have moved mostly to Provincetown most of the fishermen have moved to Provincetown. Turtle is down to 10 vessels and 150 fishermen, and that just continued. So the decline was precipitous. And the population of Turtle followed along. So you can see the period we've mostly been talking about here is this period from 1830 to 1850. And you can see the population going crazy, the investment boom, you could almost track the investment dollars and the population together. It's uh, an incredible period of growth. And then, bam, the harbor becomes unsuitable. And it, it was within literally a couple of years that the decision was made that the harbor is unsuitable. And look what happens to the population. It drops continuously all the way. This is, I think, 1930 before it begins to recover. Um, and only in 2000 does the population reach the level that it was at in 1850. So, a pretty extraordinary story. Now, to finish with a nice picture of catching mackerel today, Truro always remained, even, even after the harbor was unusable, Truro always remained a fishing center. So you had weir fishing that occurred in the late 19th century, right into the mid 20th century, and now we have a really vibrant, active charter fishing, sport fishing industry operating out of Truro, and this picture is a kid catching mackerel and the jigs that they use to catch mackerel today are very much like the jigs that were used in the 1840s to catch mackerel in roughly the same areas. So, um, Carla, would you have any final words or should we open it up? Okay, so thank you very much. We'd be happy to talk. Um, when you go back to the graphic saying that um, the typical vessel in Churro would catch about $1,200 worth of mackerel per year, mm -hmm. have you done the math to sort of put that into $2,023? Well, first of all, I don't really believe, I, don't, I mean, I wouldn't just convert it. I, I did a little bit of looking at, um, like, what, what would it cost to buy, <clears throat> sorry, I didn't use this, a house in, um, a house in about 1840 in the Outer Cape probably cost 450 to 500 dollars. So that's easier to think of it that way um, rather than just converting the um, 
you know, rates of inflation over that period. So people were being paid roughly half the cost of a house yeah. is, is sort of the average salary, half to a third of the cost of a house, which sounds sort of not too far off right. from today. Question to Carlotta, where are the ledger books from your attic today? Well, I think Tim has some of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, and is he keeping good care of them? <laughs> Very good. Very good. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, they're fascinating. Uh, yes. But you really have to know what you're looking at. But where, but where, are, but where are they now? It's in your house, mostly. Uh, in oh, other words, are you still you keeping them? Or? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you for this. It's very informative. I just wondered uh, how this balanced against the cold storage beach fishing industry at the time. Uh, was that taken away from the Planet Harvest or were they working together in any of that Later, operation? Pardon? Later, isn't it? Yeah, they, they, they weren't at the same time. So this is much cold storage occurred really? after all of the decline that we talked about. And um, was Sorry. that was really for the weir fishing industry. So there really wasn't, they weren't cannibals. For Truro, there was almost no cannibalization because Truro had its own problem, which was the shoaling up of the harbor. Yeah. Later on, yes, Provincetown and Wealthly did run into competition from the weir fishing, and that's a whole separate matter in the late 19th century. But Pearl was already toast, so <laughs> it didn't matter. Uh, two questions over here. Go ahead. Yeah, just on the development advantage of Truro to, to Wellcrete, I was interested in your speculation about how it was that Truro did better in terms of both quality and quantity. And I'm wondering how you factor in the fact that Wellcrete had a much better harbor to start with. Do you think yeah. it would have attracted more fishermen in the mission? Yeah. So I, I, what, my theory on that one would be Wellfleet Harbor is, is better protected, bigger, um, and was more usable all the time. It was the only disadvantage Wellfleet had was it's a longer sail, especially if you're all the way up at the town, to have to get around Jeremy Point or Billingsgate Shoal and then turn and sail all the way to Wood End before you can get out of the bay. So if Truro was usable, you'd rather use Truro. And when Truro became unusable, it mostly it went to Provincetown again because it's just a little more convenient. But Wellfleet also did very well at that point. Uh, yes? Did the fishermen own slaves or the related business owners own slaves during the blue period? I think the simple answer to that is not that I know of. And do you, do you know, Paul? I don't know. I yeah. think that's an earlier uh, yeah. phenomenon. There was slavery in Truro um, in the early 19th century. By this period, 1830 to 1840, I don't think so. And there was there was a connection with slavery, though, which is in a there's a Massachusetts Historical Society study of the, the whole history of the Cape, and what they talk about is that that one of the markets for fish was the Caribbean, and it was the plantations in the Caribbean where, of course, that fish was being used to feed the enslaved population. So some of the income that was being received here in Truro and elsewhere was coming from uh, selling fish that was used to feed enslaved populations, probably in the southern United States as well. We know for sure that that was occurring in the Caribbean. Yes. Um, I think the logs are really interesting, but I didn't totally understand. There was one that you called out that Sarah Dyer, I think, was paid at the end. Yeah. And then there were a couple other payments of people, I think, that you said who had died. Yes. Yeah. Is that some sort of like life insurance? Like, what is he paying those people for? He's paying them for previous voyages. So John Doyle, who Carlotta mentioned, was one of the people who died on the Pomona. He had sailed in the previous voyage. They had actually had a really good trip and brought in a lot of fish. And so that fish had been sold by Snow and Payne, the fish packing company. And they had the money, and the money had to be distributed, but most of the people to whom it was owed had now died. 
So, so that's what that was about. Theory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You want to add anything? No, just went to his father, John Doyle, or his adopted father, to Richard Lee. What sort of work did the women do while the men were away? <laughs> Name it. I mean, uh, kept. There's a wonderful uh, catalog over on one of your panels of uh, quoting Chevenet Ridge, I think, yeah. of all the duties of women. And you only have to look around the collection at the <laughs> Island House to see um, how primitive some of their um, kitchen equipment was. <laughs> and washing and so on and so forth, as well as looking after uh, livestock and gardens and so on, um, and children. And, yeah. Did they have any kind of industry, though? Did they sew and sell, anything like that? I don't think sew and sell. So they did, and, you know, sewing these and, and the uh, kind of thing mentioned, um, you know, they'd get together and finish the quilt or something like that. But I don't think really I know of, the others do, of their, of, you know, some of them are having a source of income in that way. I don't think so. I think it's that comfort. Yeah. So we do know that, uh, the question was about whether women worked in any industries. Um, and we do know that quite a few, well again, Shevna Rich says that quite a few of the teachers were women. So that was a woman's role, would be teaching school, although by no means all. And then there were um, women who, especially young women, would work in homes. And they were paid um, far less than men were paid, but they, were, they received a wage uh, as well as board. So those would be two things where we know that women actually had paying jobs during this period. Did I see another hand in the back there? Yes, one question back there. Uh, Provincetown has a large number of homes, beautiful homes, that were belonged to ships' captains. It seems to me that Furlow uh, doesn't get anywhere near the measure, and it doesn't oh, fit right. with that huge success. Mm -hmm. Well, there were a few. Um, Captain Hughes in the North Truro. Um, mm -hmm. The parsonage was owned by Captain Benjamin Davis. Was he? No, Diane. I, <laughs> I, I actually don't know that. <laughs> um, no, I, I, there were several that were associated with captains. Uh, they um, and some of the more modest ones too. Um, uh, the house on North Pamuk Road, uh, owned by uh, Nelson now. Mm -hmm. um, was Captain Snow lost in the October Gale. I mean, <laughs> you can associate them with, if you look into the histories, um, the um, uh, Historic American Building Survey will usually list if the captain had built the house. But I know what you mean. It doesn't seem quite as grand as some of them. Chuck, do you, do you know anything more about that? No. Yeah. We uh, house number in in Truro, it was built by Nathaniel Rich, 1830, mm -hmm. he was a sea captain. But it was a fairly modest home. Mm -hmm. You know, it was Cape Cod style with two right. fireplaces, you know, uh, three bedrooms upstairs. It was small by base standards. Right. Isaac Small House, too, wasn't it? Isaac Small yeah. House, too, yeah. Yeah. I think we have another question here. We talked about Truro Academy, and it shut down in 1854. Did it shut down because we saw the declining numbers of fishermen that just weren't enough students to attend? Or did it close for some other reason? That's a good question because a lot of things kind of tanked at that point. Uh, my, the chief reason, I think, is that Joshua Davis ran out of gas. Uh, he was not this, this, terribly this is well. Davis. Yeah, he was not terribly well. He, he had expended an enormous <clears throat> amount of energy for 14 years on this school and he had a job offer off Cape, which a number of his generation did, including my great-grandfather, um, who tried to make it a go of a clothing business in Truro, and it didn't, didn't work. So he and his girl-born wife moved to Medford. A lot of people left at that point. 
Uh, but I think the chief reason why it ended was Joshua Davis. But I, I suspect you're right that there were fewer people, um, they would have paid the tuition, so we were able to do it. Students. I think we're going way, way back to the color. Yes. Was, it, was there any such thing as insurance? I am really glad you asked that question. <laughs> yes. Um, I was astounded to find that insurance has existed in the fishing industry for a really long time. And Gloucester, there's, the Gloucester Historical Society has a, a document that shows all of the shipwrecks that occurred it goes back at least 200 years, and it shows how much was covered by insurance way back into the early 1800s. So Truro had also did have some insurance, and some of it was probably provided by insurance companies uh, on the mainland. But in the period around 1841, in fact, a group of Truro investors decided to form the Truro Fire and Marine Insurance Company. And this was a very badly timed investment. <laughs> <laughs> so they insured a lot of the schooners, and they also did fire insurance. And they, um, seven schooners were lost, the Truro Fire and Marine Insurance Company, which had just raised capital, goes bankrupt from the claims and uh, a lot of the individuals, maybe this is why the ship uh, captain houses aren't bigger, because they lost a lot of money um, with that insurance company and it went out of business. I believe Wellfleet actually had one that worked and there are other insurance companies in the area that were successful, but Truro's was a failure because of the storm. There was another question here. Yeah, I was surprised to hear about the large number of schooners that were in Harvard and was wondering, and you also mentioned the boatyard, and how many of those were made locally in that boatyard? Where did they get their wood from? Mm -hmm. the start from? So, 15, only 15 schooners and rigs were made in Truro. So it wasn't really a very large number in the scheme of things. And interestingly, I would have thought that most of them would end up fishing out of Truro, but they didn't. They went all over the place. They were sold to people in Beverly and down in Roanoke and in uh, Chesapeake Bay. So they went to wherever there was a customer who needed a boat built. Uh, only a few of them ended up in Truro. Um, the largest was the Escal, and the Escal, there's actually models made by Dan Saunders who uh, donated it to the museum here. And it's actually in the exhibit over here, the model of the Escal. That was 80 something feet. That was the biggest ever built here. And um, they were a whaling vessel and it did, it did whale out of Truro for three or four years. Um, where they got their timber, a lot of it did come from Truro. Apparently in that 1840s period, there was still enough oak in Truro that they were able to fell the oaks and use it for shipbuilding. And maybe one of the reasons that they stopped having shipbuilding in Truro was not just the decline of the fishing fleet, but also the fact that they ran out of oak. How big were the ships that went down in 1841, do you know? Some of them, we do. Um, so, Carlotta's uh, great-great-grandfather, Nathaniel Atkins, gives, gives the tonnage of the, gives tonnage of those vessels. So you have to convert. But the smallest ones, like the Pomona, were probably a 45 feet long, and the largest were pretty big, maybe 70 feet. And they were gradually, at that time, the schooners were already gradually getting bigger. One more question. Carla, let's say thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you all. to Tim for a wonderful presentation. Please come back and have a look at the total exhibit. Um, we love your membership and we love your donations and we love the fact that you came tonight. Thank you so much.